Hi everyone, uh, thanks for coming to this talk. Uh, hopefully you had a good lunch and uh, this is going to be interesting so you don't fall asleep. Uh, I'm Marco Verlesa, I'm working for the networking team in uh, SUSE. Uh, and today I'm going to talk to you about uh, virtual networking in the NFVI, which stands for Network Function Virtualization in Infrastructure. So uh, I'm going through uh, quite a few slides from the evolution of the data centers to few NFE concepts, um, focusing on two main vSwitches that we currently see in the open source, uh, open vSwitch and VPP. Uh, and then I'm going to talk to you about few things around platform awareness. Uh, just out of curiosity, who of you has any idea of what NFE stands for and what it is? Uh, current trends, okay. So, uh, according to the survey that Cisco ran in 2013, 77% uh, of the data center traffic uh, was seen the data center itself. Uh, now, if you think about it, it's quite a lot of data that uh, it's produced and consumed within the data center itself. Um, which is amazing if you think about the actual use that we, that we do with our PCs when we access the internet. So we usually consume data, uh, video, uh, news, or upload data. So there's a lot of that going on, and still 77% of that traffic is within the data center itself. Uh, now, if you, if you f for a second think about what that means, if you want to simply stick with a physical environment, uh, well, uh, you're gonna, you're gonna see in the bare metal situation, you're gonna see one OS per machine. Uh, the networking is going to be organized in the usual uh, access distribution and core layers. Uh, you're going to see all the, the traditional L2 and L3 problems that you would see in a data center, talking about spanning tree, for example. Um, and what's worse is if you need to offer any type of high availability to your customers, if you're a cloud, for example, cloud provider, uh, that can only be done with physical. So that means physical machine to a physical machine uh, or with uh, physical links between them. So the issues obviously connected to this is that it's a, it's a constrained environment, it doesn't really scale, uh, and it's really, really expensive, and it's complex. Uh, the network is obviously is going to be subutilized because you cannot really scale over a certain limit. Uh, if you have any failures, as I said, uh, the backup or the high availability type of scenario is going to, to have a very slow recovery. Uh, and you'll find a situation where you're going to hit pretty soon what are the limits of what you're capable of. Um, number of MAC addresses, number of VLANs, uh, how you're going to partition your network in the data center to scale to a different size. So, uh, virtualization is not a new concept, uh, but the use of it in the networking space is pretty new. We're talking about four, five years. Um, the, the thing is, with virtualization, we solved a lot of the compute issues. So, for example, now we can run multiple VMs on a single machine. Uh, we, can, uh, we, can, we can do efficient storage. We can visualize storage. And uh, obviously, we can also virtualize network cards. I'm sure that you have all heard about uh, virtual functions on using SROV or multiple queues, virtual queues, and all the magic that you can do with that. What that means, though, is that we start seeing a, a brand new type of issue. Uh, we now are talking about not just traffic hitting the, 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 the server, the compute node, but we're actually seeing traffic that East-West, which means VM to VM, uh, 
goes on the same server and still has to be handled by something. Um, we have obviously the introduction of uh, VXLAN, which created a, 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 a huge number of endpoints that are now possible to be reached versus what was possible with, v, with VLAN. Um, and, and obviously, we're talking about things like intra-server security. If you are a provider, if you're offering a service, how you make sure that somebody that's running a service on one virtual machine, now that virtual machine can talk to another virtual machine on the same host, how you guarantee the right separation bet between the two of them, talking about network traffic. Uh, it was quite clear that there was an, a need of a, of a new architecture or re revisiting what was used before and trying to ad adjust it to these new scenarios. So these pictures tries to basically give you an idea of what has been the evolution of a data center. We, we started with uh, everything being in physical, bare metal environment. Uh, we then introduced the virtual data center with all the, the, the nice aspects of visualization and the, and the computes. Uh, then there was the introduction of the vSwitches, which I'm going to, to talk to you about it in a second. Uh, and the, the next evolution of it was the vRouters. And then just uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the recent years, we, we, we have seen also the, the use of the, and the more use of the extensible data planes. These are uh, things like uh, BPF, eBPF, uh, XDP uh, from the IOVisor community, which offer uh, a great, um, a great configurability and great programmability of data planes on on on, on Linux. So, what is NFV? Uh, well, first of all, NFV stands for Network Function Virtualization, uh, and it offers the the, 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 the opportunity uh, to decouple the network function from proprietary hardware uh, and have them run in software. If you think about what was the market in the networking space uh, until a few years ago and, and still predominant, uh, it was all made of, for example, hardware switches where uh, um, company like Cisco, Juniper and, and others uh, had their big presence in the market. Uh, and why was, why was this uh, uh, architecture uh, started and, and, and thought about? Well, uh, it, uh, it started with uh, uh, service providers who wanted to basically uh, accelerate the deployment of new services uh, to increase the growth and also to reduce uh, the, the amount of money that they spend uh, with hardware. Uh, as a result, the ETSI, which is the European Telecommunication Standards Institute, uh, basically married this idea and started supporting it. And a lot of companies joined in, and a lot of experts people started producing a lot of drafts, papers, etc. So it became really uh, a sort of standard in the architecture in the way it looks like. So the, the NFV basically allows you to, to reduce your capital expenditure, which here is called CapEx. So uh, you can reduce the amount of machines that you, that you buy. Uh, it reduces the OPEX, which stands for operational expenditure, uh, because obviously buying less machines, it means that in the data center you can use less power, you can use less cooling, uh, to, to, to keep the temperature okay for the equipment. Uh, and it also accelerates the time to market because now everything is, is virtual. Everything can be, the, can be deployed with a click. You can configure things in an easier way. Uh, so people that want to, to try out new things, that want to, to test new things, uh, have the chance of doing it. Uh, and it also offers uh, uh, a, a great degree of agility, uh, because what you can do, you can easily scale up and down just by turning on a new virtual machine, switching it off based on the needs. 
it would have been much, much harder if you want to basically go and buy a server or configure a server on the fly when you need it. Uh, so in the NFV world, uh, the architecture is quite vast. Uh, and obviously, there are different layers, there are different components. Um, I, a very important part of it uh, is played by the data plane, and by the control plane. Uh, and there is this concept of vSwitch, which stands for virtual switch. Uh, a virtual switch is, is a software component that basically allows you to run traffic between VMs and can also allow you to, to have that traffic reaching the outside world. So what happens is that a VM can, can communicate with another VM on the same physical machine, uh, and the same VM, if needed, can reach the internet, for example. Uh, what's, what's nice about a virtual switch is that it basically leaves within the hypervisor itself. So now the hypervisor has as a network functionality as well, added to the overall virtualization methodologies and techniques that's implemented in there. Um, and, and, um, and, and basically, uh, it's much easier now if you want to roll out a network functionality to, to roll it out on your lab and then in your production environment. You can simply add a new feature in a V switch and tried it out. Uh, and what's nice about it is that you can even be on a machine that is not connected to any other machine and you can still you do all your stuff with VMs. One of the biggest challenges that are faced by the uh, NFV uh, infrastructure in general is the very different requirements that are um, present in, in the different uh, in, in the different sectors in, of the industry. Uh, for example, on this on this slide, I, I picked uh, requirements from an enterprise data center versus a telco provider. Uh, so, if you think about it, in an enterprise data center, most of the traffic is even these days just 10 gigabit. Uh, while telco networks have 40 plus gigabit network requirements. Uh, if you think about the packet sizes, which are really the, the frames that are sent by, by the machines and handled by the machines on, in a data center, uh, in a data center you would expect this traffic to be a mixed type of traffic. Imagine there are queries coming for, for uh, web pages, uh, MySQL queries, Oracle queries, uh, intra-machine, uh, machine learning type of stuff. Uh, while the telco network has to deal with a lot of control packets, and control packets are usually very, very small packets. We're talking about 64 bytes packet, 96 bytes packet. Uh, the average being 72 or 74. Um, Obviously, another, another requirement is the expectation of uh, the customers in these two different uh, domains. So an enterprise data center really wants to, to get the software out of the box, install it, and, and just run with it. Uh, a telco network instead usually focus a lot on customization because that's how they differentiate between another provider they can offer you one thing versus another feature. Uh, so they, they customize products a lot and they spend a lot of time and money in, in doing that. Uh, with regards to performance, here I'm, I'm using the word none for the enterprise data centers as a, as a sort of uh, the more the better, right? Uh, on the other hand, the, the telco providers have very strict requirements on, for example, things like latency and jitter. Um, those requirements are not coming just out of the box there. They're coming from uh, standards. So if you implement, for example, a 3G network, you have specific requirements. Uh, if you have a 4G network, you have much stricter requirements. And now with 5G, 
things are going just crazy. So it's very hard to, to pick one solution that can fit all this. Uh, usually they're tailored solutions uh, and people need to really know exactly what they can achieve with each subcomponent in order to meet their requirements. So as I said at the beginning, uh, in this presentation I'm going to focus mainly on two V switches. One is the open V switch and the other one is the VPP. Uh, on the open V switch side, I'm going to be much quicker because we have another presentation later on today uh, that I actually encourage you to attend. It's about OBS and DPDK integration. Uh, and it's a little bit more on the VPP. Uh, what's interesting about these two projects, they can, uh, they can run and use the standard uh, kernel path communication for handling packets, so standard socket based, uh, but they can also integrate uh, with DPDK, which stands for Data Plane Development Kit and is uh, uh, the cutting edge in the open source for, uh, uh, for packet handling and packet processing. So what is uh, Open vSwitch, uh, which abbreviated is uh, OBS? So it's a software-based solution. As I said earlier, it's a, it's a vSwitch, so it's software, um, and offers a fe flexible controller in user space, where uh, we actually see uh, a daemon running, and you have all the nice tools that you can use to, to basically instruct the switch with specific flows, for example. Uh, and it has what's called the fast data path, in user space. As I said, I'm going to talk about the OVS DPDK. Uh, if it was the standard OVS, this data path is actually implemented within the kernel. Uh, it also provides an implementation of OpenFlow. So if you want to use OpenFlow to, to configure and instruct your, uh, your virtual switch, you can do so. And it's uh, based on Apache 2 license. So just because I said to you that there are two incarnations of OBS. Um, I think this picture is quite nice. It basically shows you how the two differs between, the, between them. On the left hand side, there is the uh, OBS standard version, which is the one using the kernel. And on the right hand side, there is the one that basically integrates with the data plane development kit. So on the left hand side, uh, there is another component, which is a kernel module, which is called openvswitch.ko that runs in the kernel and communicates with the user space through a netlink infrastructure. Um, what happens is that the data plane is handled in the kernel and any exceptions to this data plane, which means basically a flow that is not learned or a flow that is not configured, uh, a packet that uh, basically missed it uh, will, will be sent to user space where a daemon will handle this packet to basically either be configured or discarded. On the right hand side instead, uh, the kernel module disappears and, and all you have is a very small interface which is offered by either the IGB UIO, UIO PCI generic or the VFIO PCI uh, kernel module to expose the network cards bars to the drivers that are actually running in user space and these drivers are called pole mode drivers. The, the name is coming because all these drivers are not uh, usual drivers that are driven by interrupts, but they instead they keep polling the NIC for packets coming in. And in this case, the, uh, the forwarding plane, it's sitting in user space itself. So everything runs in user space. Uh, the way that OVS works is can can run in two different modes uh, called normal and flow based. The normal mode basically acts as a, as a standard layer 2 switch. Uh, what basically it does is it puts uh, the, network on, the, the, the network card in learning mode so it can learn new flows coming in um, and uh, it forwards the frames to the previously learned DMAC, uh, or basically can also flood the frame, the frame, depending on the configuration that you set it. Um, 
If you set it to flow mode instead, uh, all of a sudden you see your vSwitch behaving as a sort of firewall as well, because anything that is not being configured on the vSwitch is basically dropped. So uh, you will have to have uh, flows in your flow table to allow traffic through your vSwitch. And since I mentioned the, the concept of flow table, um, what a flow table is, is that it's, a, it's literally a table, uh, and it's composed by a match and an action part. Uh, a match is basically uh, allowing you to, to specify the fields on the packet that you want to match against. Uh, imagine uh, it could be the source MAC, the DMAC, it could be a source IP or destination IP. You can pretty much match on whatever you want in the packet. Uh, and when a packet comes in, it goes through this uh, flow table. And when a match is found, we call it hit. And the action according to this match will be performed. So you can have, for example, forward which means that packet will be forwarded to, uh, for example, a DMAC address. Um, interestingly, you can, uh, you can also use wildcards uh, for, for the matches, which basically um, allows the user to simplify some use cases. For example, in many cases, you don't care about a source port uh, or a source MAC might be relevant or not. So you can wildcard those in order to reduce the number of flows that you have in your flow table. Uh, if you have any questions, you can interrupt me anytime. On the other end, uh, we have VPP. Uh, VPP stands for Vector P Packet Processing, uh, and it's as the word says, is opposed to the concept of a scalar processing. Um, it's an extensible framework uh, that, it, that offers really production quality uh, uh, for switch router functionality. The reason why it's production quality is that VPP comes from uh, many years of learning and developing of Cisco, who basically donated this software component to the uh, open source community uh, 18 months ago, uh, and they've actually used it in many, many years on their products. So it's pretty stable and been production tested. Uh, VPP uh, is part of the bigger project called uh, FIDO, which is written FD.io, uh, and is hosted by the uh, Linux Foundation. Uh, one of the uh, um, one of the differences of VPP compared to OVS is that OVS, as I said, implements a flow table and each packet will go through this flow table uh, and obviously you are going to have a performance hit because of that because depending on where your flow sits in the flow table you'll be quicker or slower to find your match. Uh, if you have thousands of entries in your flow table, your packet will go through through it uh, and it could basically reach the, the bottom part before uh, being processed. Um, on the other end, VPP, what it does is, in, is implementing a graph. Uh, and not only that, but it's also processing packets in a vector-based mode. What that means is that instead of having each single packet that comes from the NIC going through the graph at, uh, one by one, the whole, the whole lot of packets in a vector mode will be processed by each node on the graph. Uh, you may think that it's basically the same thing. Uh, it's actually not. Um, and it's also different from the concept of uh, polling from the NIC in, 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 in batch mode. This is real data plane processing. What happens is that because it's being handled as a vector, uh, we're going, we are seeing less instruction cache misses, less data cache misses. There is a, a real optimization in terms of cache utilization. 
and actually all this helps boosting the performance of your uh, of your appliance of your uh, server really really considerably um, it's also very flexible uh, because if you need to to add a new functionality you don't have to know all the details of the overall design and over the overall code which trust me is quite a bit of code base uh, but what you can do you can create a new node which uh, in the FVPP world is a plugin so you write your new code following the plugin interface you implement it and you can plug it in at a specific part of the graph where you require it to be so it's very flexible uh, and it's uh, it's quite uh, developer friendly there are many use cases in, in the VPP world uh, the, 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 the first one is uh, the virtual switch or router. Um, what happens is that together with, uh, with the library sets that, that you get with, uh, with VPP, you also get a CLI. Uh, and this, this CLI allows you to basically run uh, through the command line uh, the configuration required to, to basically set up a virtual switch or a, or a, or a router. And uh, in literally five or six different commands that you run between the uh, Linux part and the VPP specific part, you have a, a, a V switch going on between uh, two endpoints, being them uh, virtual machines or being them uh, containers. It's very, very uh, straightforward and easy. At the same time, uh, VPP offers uh, both local and remote programmability. And the way they do it is to, to basically uh, have their set of API on top of, their, uh, on top of their code. They do not support things like OpenFlow, so you have to stick with the, AP the API that they give you. Uh, the interesting thing is uh, the API available are for a really big set of programming languages. You can use C, C++, Java, Python, Lua. So you can basically pick the language you prefer, and they all have the same interface. It also offers uh, remote programmability. Uh, basically, you can imagine you would like to integrate your uh, virtual switch or virtual router uh, with things like uh, Open Delight, for example, which is uh, the SDN controller de facto these days. Uh, and it offers a specific interface, and it offers uh, also currently available projects that allow you to, to control VPP through Open Delight. Okay. Uh, I think recently enough, uh, six, eight months. Uh, it also integrates directly with uh, OpenStack through the ML2 plugin mechanism driver. Uh, the only thing is the code is not part of VPP. You'll have to, to pull it from, uh, from GitHub, from the OpenStack GitHub. Um, and in this way, you can basically skip the overhead of integrating VPP with ODL and, and then ODL with OpenStack. You could go straight directly talking OpenStack to uh, VPP in a similar way as it's possible for OBS. <coughs> so, uh, as I said that earlier, uh, VPP is a high performance user space network stack. Uh, and the interesting bit is that it can run on commodity hardware. So, Similar, and this is very similar to OBS. Uh, you can pick a x86 machine, uh, whatever it is, you can install Linux and then install uh, VPP, that will run. Obviously, you can expect different type of performance based on the machine that you're deploying it on. Uh, the same code can run on the host or in VMs or Linux containers. In fact, as I said, uh, it's very, very easy uh, also thanks to the, to the nice uh, abstractions 
done by the API to set up the same type of, uh, of setup scenario, uh, whether being using VMs for uh, communications or containers. Um, it, as I said, uh, it basically um, integrates with DPDK, uh, which is currently the best of the breed uh, open source driver technology for packet processing. Uh, and is extensible using pl the plugins interface. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. So if we think about the, the, the differences or if we put them side by side, um, because they use DPDK, uh, they have already a lot of commonalities in terms of what you require on your platform to make this run. So for example, uh, you will have to enable the huge page support, uh, whether being a two megabyte or one gigabyte uh, pages, you will have to use one or the other. Uh, you will have to enable the IUMMU, which, uh, which if you want a better performance, you can set it up as a pass-through mode. Uh, the reason why you need the Intel IMMU option is to enable SRIOV on your system. And obviously you will, you will need things like VTX, VTD uh, enabled in the BIOS. Um, what else? Well, both uh, vSwitch will require you to, to basically pick a specific driver, whether being IGB, UIO, UIO PCI generic or VFI, UOPCI and basically bind your NIC to those drivers, which then eventually will be used uh, by the Polmod drivers in DPDK to take the packets out of the NIC. Instead, if we think about the design, if we look at the architecture and the design of the two different um, components, two different uh, software, they look very differently. In fact, we can talk about apples and oranges. Uh, the OpenV switch, as I said earlier, it's based on a match action type of uh, approach, uh, while VPP is based on vector packet processing using a graph. Um, the the OpenV switch has this concept of the fast path versus the slow path. Uh, instead, VPP is more focused on the extensibility of the functionality via plugins. Uh, similarly, VPP has always been uh, taught and designed with a high level of par parallelism. Uh, and as I said, it doesn't really think about integration with uh, controllers per se, like SDN controllers. It does not implement open flow, as I said. Uh, while OVS has been more focusing on the northbound part of, of the stack, thinking about things like open flow integration, and, uh, and they also support the OVSDB, which is another uh, protocol which allows you to basically configure the, uh, the vSwitch itself. I'm not going through this slide in details. Uh, it's more, if you download it, you can, you can actually see it. Um, they are all very much re uh, features rich. Uh, they offer pretty much the same type of functionality in one flavor or the other. Um, something that uh, just I, I just learned uh, two months ago is uh, with uh, in, in VPP, there's going to be very soon a full TCP stack implemented in user space. Uh, and that's going to open up uh, a lot of more scenarios and more things to be done with it, which is going to be very interesting to, to be seen. With regards to the, uh, to the integration bit, how these two components talk to other components in the much bigger uh, NAV orchestration architecture. Well, um, as I said, the OpenV switch allows to basically speak many languages. It, it allows the support of OpenFlow, supports OVSDB, uh, and it has a straight integration with the ML2 uh, mechanism driver in OpenStack. Uh, VPP has also now 
the, the integration with OpenStack directly through the ML2 plugin, uh, ML2 driver mechanism. Uh, however, I'm not aware of being used and deployed heavily. Uh, while they, 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 they stick a little bit more and emphasize more on the open delight integration uh, with Onecomp. And uh, whether being a positive thing or not, uh, it does not support OpenFlow. So, as I said, I just wanted to also uh, touch base a little bit on the platform awareness. Uh, there's a lot on, ongoing with hardware in general and what you can do with it. So, um, one thing that I would like to stress is because these two words, acceleration and offloads, are very often used interchangeably, they actually mean uh, two different things when you think about what you do with your hardware and, or with your software. So, the acceleration is to take advantage of either techniques or methodologies which allow you to, to improve any aspect of the performance of your software stack, uh, being throughput, latency, scalability. The offload instead, what we mean is to defer to a third party component, which is usually hardware, uh, the full execution of a given functionality. You can imagine uh, for example, taking ad advantage of a hardware capability to do checksum, and that's pretty much enabled by default on every single network card driver. Uh, or TSO for TCP segmentation offload, or recently VXLAN, in-cap, decap, whether being uh, stateful or stateless, uh, many network cards these days offer that functionality as well. But what that means is that software has nothing to do with that execution. It just tells the hardware to take care of it, and usually the software stack just gets a, a callback uh, to be told what the result of that execution was. Another important aspect, uh, just because more and more uh, this architecture is, uh, is present these days, is, uh, is NUMA, which stands for Non-Uniform Memory Access. Uh, what, what this is, is that basically these days most of the servers using data centers are made of blades and those blades can talk to each other through a backplane. Uh, and eventually, anyway, your OS is deployed on the overall uh, machine. So your OS now can see the different nodes, uh, which obviously already have multiple cores. Uh, and for whoever's done multi-threading programming is already aware of what multi-threading uh, problems are. And if you scale it up to a NUMA platform, then it means that you will also have to, to take care of and know where those cores with those threads are running. Because if you, for example, start crossing the interconnect bus, which on Intel is called QPI, you will start paying down latency, your throughput will decrease, uh, and obviously your system doesn't work as expected. So being aware of, for example, where your PCI and where your memory is plugged onto and where your software is running, on which node, on which course, uh, and how it communicates with other processes on different cores is very, very important. Uh, I think in this regards, uh, a very good tool that we that we have on, on Linux is the NUMA CTL tool, uh, which very easily can show you the topology of your of your um, infrastructure of, of your machine, can uh, basically show which are the cores numbered on which nodes, how much memory is actually attached to each node, um, and which node is handling which PCI devices, because in some cases. Uh, the PCI connectivity is specific to specific nodes. So, if you, if you can see this on the right-hand side, there is an example of, uh, of a NUMA CTL, which shows on, on the machine that I was using four different nodes. It's quite a powerful machine. Uh, and on each node, 24 cores. And it also shows at the end the topology of it. So, uh, basically highlighting 
what is the gap between each node. And obviously, because it's a matrix, you would expect the diagonal of the matrix to be constant because it refers to the same node. Uh, and all the rest with an increased uh, cost. And in fact, if you can see it, the diagonal there is shown as 10, meaning that from node 1 to node 1, I'm actually paying nothing. And then I would pay 21, so more than double the cost to reach from node 1 to node 2. And the rationale is that I'm going through a bus that connects the two nodes. Another aspect is related to uh, the hardware assistance and hardware uh, accelerations for network cards specifically. Now, before I can actually talk about the two um, acceleration techniques, uh, let me tell you how it works in, on the basics. So when you have your hypervisor uh, and it's virtualizing your NIC, which basically takes packets from an RX queue and send packets to a TX queue. Uh, that hypervisor has to do two very basic and fundamental things. One is sorting the packets, and the other one is routing the packets. So in order to, to send the packets to the right VM, what it does is basically taking decisions on an L2 base, which is similar to what a, a switch does. Uh, in the first case, instead of uh, acceleration technique, which is called VMDQ, is basically taking advantage of virtual queues available on the RX side and on the TX side, uh, so that these queues can be directly mapped to a specific VM. You may think that is very similar concept, but is not because what these queues are connected with is, is also with higher queues. And what you can do is that you can map higher queues to be handled by specific cores. And by pinning specific higher queues to specific cores, you're basically reducing the amount of context switch and overhead of other cores doing other things. Uh, and instead, they're focusing exactly on the particular traffic that is going to hit your VM. Uh, the only issue, although this was the, 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 the first version of this acceleration, there is still one bit missing here to make it better. Uh, in fact, in this scenario, the hypervisor still has to do the last memory copy of the packets coming from the virtual queues to the VM, or from the VM to the TX queues in case of uh, ascend traffic. And, and that problem is actually <clears throat> solved by the other technique, which is called SRIOV. Uh, with SRIOV, we are not talking about virtual queues anymore. We're talking about virtual functions. Uh, it's a much more advanced way of basically dealing with your network card. It offers uh, barriers between virtual functions and all the security that goes with it. But if we stick with the uh, with the problem associated with memory copies, then there is no need now for the hypervisor to perform the memory, the last memory copy or the first memory copy uh, anymore because the virtual function is directly mapped into the VM memory space. It's already is directly managed by a specific driver, uh, which is a, a slightly different version of the network driver that you would use on the host. Uh, and what allows you is to basically deal with the network card driver, with the network card itself directly from a VM. So the hypervirus is completely bypassed and does not take care of it anymore. Uh, there are some caveats, obviously, around the use of SRIOV. Uh, not all good things come for free. Um, Depending on which network card you use, you may or may not have SRIOV functionalities. Uh, usually all the very expensive network cards have it. Similarly, there is a limit to the amount of virtual functions that you can have. Um, I think the, the one that has the most these days has 64 
virtual functions available, which means that you can have on one single Ethernet port 64 uh, virtual devices. But not more than that. So if you want to, to have a 65th VM, then you cannot, or that VM cannot talk on that network card, or you have to find different ways. Uh, and with this, I'm open to questions, if you have any and you're still alive. You mentioned that... Yeah, so, so you mentioned that uh, VPP has DPDK support. What about ODP? ODP also has an integration with DPDK. Right, so it'd still go through DPDK, you wouldn't be talking VPP direct to IDP. Come again? So, so what you've got the VPP um, interface to DPDK, there's no interface to IDP, you'd still go through DPDK to then get to IDP. Yes. Right. Yes, there's no VPP or DP yeah. type of scenario. No. Okay. If no more questions, thank you.